Welcome everyone. Good morning and thank you for joining the Ceratec webinar using FEMAP and NX NASTRAN for frequency spectrum and random vibration analysis. My name is Patricia Riva Denera from Ceratec and I am your host today. I would now like to introduce John LaCour, your structural analysis professional who is based out of Houston, Texas. John, you now have control. All right, thank you very much. Uh, the first thing I want to say is today, uh, the demo that you're going to be seeing is uh, using the NX NASTRAN dynamic module. And so if you don't have that module and you want to try to reproduce this, uh, you're not going to be able to do that. And let's see, I think you can see my screen now. Uh, so if you don't have the dynamic module and you're interested, there is uh, a demos license available. And I would recommend that you, if you're interested uh, in this module, contact your Ceratec sales rep. Okay, today we're going to talk about uh, using uh, BMAP NX NASTRAN for frequent, frequency spectrum and random vibration analysis. And, and our agenda is going to be pretty simple. We're going to, we're going to look at the uh, uh, NX NASTRAN FEMAP frequency response analysis, we'll look at a little demo, and then we're going to move over to random, uh, random response analysis uh, using FEMAP NX NASTRAN. And so, um, uh, it's important when you're doing dynamic analysis, if you're just doing a transient, uh, you you put a, a time history forcing function in and you get a response out. In many cases, the the structure itself is unknown. You really, it's besides looking at a solution 103 or a normal mode, you kind of get an idea what's going on, but you really don't know where the energy is going. And so the, the structure itself is somewhat of a transfer function in the, in the frequency domain. And so with the frequency response uh, analysis, by looking at the frequency response, we can kind of look at where the energy is going into the structure. And so we're going to kind of look at that today. And uh, uh, also, uh, there's several ways to do dynamic testing. Uh, one of the more expensive ways and probably one of the best ways is modal testing. But also, you could, you could do a sign sweep on there. It doesn't tell you everything. Uh, but it would give you some indication. They are cheaper. And it would give you an indication uh, of some way to correlate your model uh, with a test uh, to do a sign sweep, and that in a frequency uh, uh, frequency response analysis will allow you to do that. And then uh, you can kind of see the uncertainties in your model and uh, apply uncertainty factors if that's what you want to do. And in lieu of uh, adjusting your model or tweaking it, you could just see where where the uncertainties are and apply those uncertainty factors. And I'll kind of give you a little example of that as we move on. Um, and then the other side, since we're talking about frequency response, is random vibration and uh, FEMAP index NASTRAN actually uses a frequency response to do a random vibration. So they really kind of go hand in hand. Uh, and so that's why I'm putting these topics together. And so random vibration is a little bit different. It's, it's, it's statistical analysis. It is uh, uh, you, uh, where you have some idea of what the vibration environment is. You just don't know when the peaks are going to happen. And so it provides uh, some statistical analysis for that. And so some examples would be uh, earthquake uh, wave heights, um, uh, pressure fluctuations on an aircraft or tall buildings, uh, and uh, uh, also mechanical yeah, rocket engine, jet engine noises, acoustic excitations. Those are some of the examples. And I have to say, if, if you have that type of environment that uh, in your structure that you're analyzing and you're, and you're neglecting random vibration, your answer's go going to be wrong and you really need to, to look at that. Um, and so NASTRAN performs a, uh, a random vibration response analysis in the post-processing to the frequency response. And uh, you're allowed to put in the, the random vibration uh, environment and, uh, and output uh, the auto and cross-spectral uh, cross densities. And we'll take a look at that. So what I want to do now is move over to my to uh, FEMAP. And so here's here's the structure I'm going to be working with today or looking at. And um, uh, the, and so what I'm going to do today is do a base drive on this, kind of just like I would tie it to a shaker table and shake it, and I'll be uh, exciting it in the Y direction. Okay. And so the first thing any person would do uh, who's doing dynamic analysis, I'd want to look at the structural characteristics of it. So what I did is I ran the normal modes. And so here you can see uh, the first, uh, you know, the first 20 frequencies that I looked at. And uh, so typically what, what, what one might do 
is to, uh, to set up a frequency response and say, I want to look at uh, the response at uh, from zero to, in this case, I went from zero to a thousand hertz every 20 hertz. And that's a very simple, in Nastran, that's a very simple card. And actually, it's very simple uh, in, in FEMAP in X Nastran. And so that's what I did. I just said, uh, let me look at it. It's very simple to set up this, this up. And, and I looked at it every uh, 20 hertz to a thousand hertz. Okay. So then I can come over here and let's just uh, uh, look at. Look at the response, and so here, here's here's the response right here, of this structure. Uh, we can see that there's uh, three modes that are excited here, um, out of all these modes, and actually the the ones is actually mode one, four, and six are the modes that are that are excited here. And so I could say, okay, we're we're seeing that it is in the y direction. If I went and animated the mode shapes, sure, those those are the mode shapes in the y direction. Uh, that are excited in the y direction. So I could be kind of confident right here that, that I got good data. But you notice I did uh, excite it only at 80 hertz, and we the mode shapes at 81.74, or roughly 75. And so that might be good enough. I might stop there. Uh, but we could, I, but FEMAP will allow you to create, and I'm going to come over here to the, to the model to my um, analysis page of setting up this frequency response and show you uh, FEMAP will allow you to set, uh, select a, uh, a, to go to the uh, normal modes and use those modes to build your frequency table, okay? And so what this option is, you click this right here, this option right here. And so all of a sudden it goes and looks and says you ran a normal modes and here's your here's your frequencies from your normal mode. So instead of using the 80 hertz, which I say is close, uh, FEMAP will go ahead and set this table up for you based on your output from your normal modes and will do analysis right on uh, the frequency, uh, the exact frequency from your normal modes. And you can come down here in order to uh, uh, curve fit better and say I want to pick some points uh, around the, the normal modes. That is, it, it give me five points, it would be two on either side, and of course one, one right on the frequency. And with a 10% with a frequency spread, if you need more resolution, go seven, go uh, nine, go something like that, some odd number, and uh, to, get better, uh, to get better resolution. So here it will build this for you, and actually to build it by hand can be a quite time-consuming uh, uh, event. So. So let's just see, is it really worth uh, doing that? And so I'm going to come over here on my second run and uh, go to my view, which has the wrong view. And let's just take a look. And here I ran it. It's, again, this is very low level, but let's look at this. So here I actually, if we come down here and look at the output, I actually uh, did a frequency response analysis and and chose that that exact mode shape frequency, and let's look at the difference here. 0.278 G's, and actually 0.656 G's. There's a big difference there. So it really, in order to run your, uh, in order to get a good accurate number, uh, you need to run your normal modes and use FEMAP to let it build uh, your your frequency uh, spectrum. A table for you that you'll be doing the analysis on. Now, I, I want to say, let's just say we were comparing it. Hopefully, our, our test would not be that far off. That is uh, 0.278 uh, to 0.656. But let's say we did a, uh, a, a test and, and there was some difference there. Our test was showing higher Gs. Uh, we could go and change our model, change masses, change stiffness. It's sometimes it's kind of like tuning a piano. It's very time consuming. Or you could just uh, figure out your uncertainty. You know your your test is showing a higher level of loads, and uh, your actual model is lower. So you could ratio that. You know, I guess in this case, if that really was was uh, that's my actual model, and that was a test, I could probably ratio it three to four times uh, with an uncertainty factor, and just move on and know that I'm covered. You know, in my analysis. So and and uh, not not uh, tune my model any further. Uh, you, you could also come down and look at these peaks as well to figure out how, you know, maybe an, an averaging as well. But you'd have an idea how much your model is, is off on those uh, on those peaks. 
Um, so uh, that's what uh, what uh, FEMAP NX NASRAN will allow to do in a frequency response. And of course, I can look at stresses uh, and displacements as well. Now, what I want to do is uh, that being said, with the same structure, I want to move on and look at uh, the random vibration of doing a random vibration analysis on the same structure. Um, and so, I again, I have the same structure, and I use, I'm going to show you what the curve that I used here, actually for both of them. Uh, I'm going to pull this over here, and here's uh, my environment that I put in, which is just uh, a very low level 0.01, uh, 0.01 uh, G squared per hertz. And you got to remember, uh, the input you're putting in, and of course this output that we're getting out is g squared uh, per hertz. So I ran my uh, random vibration. Uh, again, I use that same uh, the same frequency table as I come down here and look at the uh, at the cases. And actually, my I don't have my normal modes here, but what I do is I have this is the the uh, same frequency analysis here. And if I looked at that, it would look the same as what I just showed you. Uh, but in a random vibration uh, you're going since it's statistical in nature. You're going to get really a power, a, a spectral density function, and uh, they use power spectral density. It's actually you're going to be looking at acceleration. So I'm looking at the same uh, node point that I was looking at uh, earlier. To earlier in this presentation, we were looking at point two roughly, and then a point six, almost point seven G's. Now we're looking at 43, and that might come uh, bring you to some alarm. But this really doesn't mean anything by itself because this is random vibration. And actually, this number here is G squared per hertz, which really uh, you can't put your hand on. But in random vibration, uh, statistically, uh, any any frequency can be excited at the same time. And this, and we're we are looking at worst case that any frequency can be excited at any time. So instead of going and say, well, at this frequency, the peak is going to be 43 Gs or 43 Gs per hertz. In order to figure out what the load is or the acceleration on the structure is, uh, the, is, is we look at the area under the curve, and we could, in many cases, there is software out there to, to look at that, and there is spreadsheets. I'm going to pull this one back over here. This is a sp spreadsheet that actually you can put those points in there, uh, but if in this case, uh, and it will tell you the area of the GM, GRMS under the curve, or the area under the curve. That could be quite time consuming. Uh, actually, what you can do, what NASTRAN does, is it gives you, NX NASTRAN and FEMAP, it's actually FEMAP, and it gives you the RMS values here. Uh, and so, how you would go about looking at your RMS values is uh, you would open up a data table because uh, we're no longer looking, we're looking at the area under the curve, we're no longer looking at a plot, okay? And so, you make sure your data table is open and you would come over here. To uh, uh, to out to your to list your output, and you'd go to your results, and so uh, you can change the you know the, the the columns or rows however you want the data, and so we can let's look at the uh, the acceleration the acceleration, and so I would select this, and so we're looking at the data that data table that was output. And I'm not really interested in any of this, but I am interested in the RMS values. So I'll select that. And I'm interested also in the positive crossings. And we'll talk just a little bit about that. Now, since I excited it in the Y direction, I'm only going to look at the Y direction loads because I think the others are going to be quite low. So then I will go ahead and do that. I'm just going to select all the points, all, the, all our node points, and take a look at it. And so here it is. Uh, it's in the Y direction. Here's our, here's our node points right here, and uh, here's your positive crossings. So with uh, this data table, in order to kind of look at our accelerations as each node point, or what I'm, again, looking at the area under the curve, that's all this is, is integrating the area under the curve for each one of these for, for, the, total, uh, for the total acceleration. Uh, this kind of gives me this nice ta data table, kind of gives me a nice way to look around at my structure to see, um, to look at my loads. I can actually sort this thing. And this actually is my lowest load. And I know for a fact, I'm looking over here, that uh, that this right here, that this is at the base. I'm actually driving this point right here. That's one of the points at the base that I'm actually driving uh, with this. Uh, I'm going to pull this over right here. 
I'm actually driving uh, that point with this frequency random vibration spectrum. I figured out the area under the curve. What is the GMS for this? It is actually 2.5. And actually, if I come back over here and look at this, uh, it's pretty close to 2.5 right here. So uh, BMAP is actually giving me a very accurate answer here uh, on what is, and, and all these points are located at the base. So, uh, but if I want to see what my highest accelerations are, I just click on that, and here's my highest accelerations, and that's uh, at, you know 18.6 uh, G's, and of course that's on the free end of the structure out there. And so this really kind of gives you a, a nice way to sort it. You can sort it by ID if you if you actually just want to look through the model and see what your accelerations are around the model. Um, you can sort it this way and look at your maximum acceleration. Now the benefits to this, if uh, in a lot of cases uh, they the uh, user or the one who actually has the structure and you might be connecting your hardware to the structure and they have a requirements they would they will hand you maybe give you a uh, a power or excel acceleration spectral density function or they can just say here's here's the uh, uh, grms you need to design your structure to and of course if i was going to do it for this structure if you were to ask me what should i design it to what's what would we enveloping i would say it's you know 18.68, probably round it to 19 Gs. And of course, this is average. So in order to really statistically uh, cover oneself, you probably need to multiply it times uh, two sigma, or have a two sigma, or even probably more of a three sigma is probably normal. So that would take this up times three, put it over 50 Gs, which is pretty high. But maybe your uh, your structure or whatever you're mounting to this truss is really not out on the end of the truss, uh, and maybe you're limited on the structure, on the acceleration, and so you need to move your uh, your structure around uh, to limit the Gs that it's seeing. Well, you can easily scale, sort, go down and find other parts of the structure that have less Gs. So you really don't have to to use such a high G environment. As a matter of fact, if you move on down the structure, of course, this cantilever, we know how it's gonna work on a cantilever beam as we go towards the, the base of it, uh, the G levels are gonna go down. But if it's something that's more complicated, you can actually just uh, scale around on the structure until you find some, hey, this is a acceptable G level. Let's find out, are these are acceptable G levels? Let's find out where these are located and maybe hook our, attach our, uh, our box or our structure to this area. So it uh, versus uh, you know designing to uh, six Gs times three versus 18 Gs times three. So it really makes it nice to kind of look around on your structure and just see what the GRMS, GRMS response is. Now we have this um, right here, this uh, positive crossing right here, and this kind of this is what this is is telling you is how many times uh, this uh, that it crosses the axis, that is loads. Uh, in hertz, that is per second, and so this will help aid you in doing a dam damage analysis uh, from uh, from random vibration loads. And again, if it is a, a cycle issue count, uh, you can go ahead and sort that and look at the the high cycles and go to low cycles. So we can go look at uh, uh, that is not just total cycles, but this is again this is reverse cycles. So. Uh, it gives you the ability to uh, sort that and take a look at it. Also, uh, I'm going to clear the table and show you what, one more thing before we quit this. Uh, we can come in here and we can actually look at uh, at stresses as well. And so, uh, you know, I'd go ahead and bring that up on the table. But uh, you can look at stresses. You can also look at the uh, uh, the uh, uh, the number of crossings on your stresses as well. And so, uh, you know, I'm kind of running short of time, so I'm going to go ahead and move back uh, uh, to my chart to kind of wrap this up. And so uh, in the conclusion here, you can see where the frequency response analysis will aid in the understanding of the dynamic characteristics of the structure. You know, we could actually, we can look at that, that plot there, the frequency response plot, and really see where uh, the energy is or where the, the high Gs are in our structure and what modes are contributing to that. And, and that also we can, we could pull up uh, the Gs in, in the uh, spreadsheet and actually go up and down and sort them to see where the high Gs are in our structure uh, from the frequency response. Uh, this uh, can, and many people have done it, uh, have chosen to use a sign sweep uh, versus a more costly uh, modal test get to verify their structure 
uh, that, that their dynamic uh, model is giving uh, good data. Um, and, uh, and assisting, you know, if, if you're doing a launch vehicle automotive, aircraft structure, earthquakes and that, uh, there's no way you can get around without looking at random vibration. And again, uh, if, if uh, you use just a enveloping uh, GMS load, you're going to be using very high, in most cases, very high loads in your structure. You're going to, have to build a very uh, strong structure and might not need that, and, it, and also a very heavy structure as well. And so with the random vibration analysis, it will help define the random vibration at points of interest. Uh, uh, and so you can actually uh, tune your structure, or actually move things around on your structure uh, to minimize the random vibration load. And again, this reduces the, the load environment. So uh, this is the benefits of using NXNASTRAN and FEMAP to do a frequency response analysis and to do a uh, random vibration response analysis. I'll turn it back over to Patty. Thank you, John. I appreciate your time in delivering this really great uh, presentation. Now we'll begin our questions and answers session. Okay, we have a couple coming in. Uh, let's start with this one. Uh, you said that one can perform a sign sweep on a shaker table. If this structure is too large for the shaker table, how would this structure be tested? Okay. Well, uh, I did mention a shaker table, and I and I did shake it like you would put on a, a shaker table uh, for a, you know for random vibration or sign sweep. Um, and of course, you'd be doing it low level uh, so that you would guarantee that you wouldn't damage your structure. But also, uh, you can use actuators that are used for modal testing. Modal, t you know, modal test configuration. Uh, can actually do a sign sweep, and, and they do them quite often. So uh, you don't have to actually bolt it to a shaker table. You actually can have it sitting on the floor and just put a little actuator on that. Or and some kind, sometimes they give better results if you suspend it free free, and uh, you can put a little, you can put accelerometers, and then they have very low level uh, actuators that will do a sign sweep on it and give you the same answer. Okay, great. Uh, we have another question here. Um, someone wants to know if you have any good references for looking further into random analysis using NASTRAN. Yes, I do. Um, uh, well, I would refer you to uh, there's. I would refer you to the um, uh, the documentation, the the technical, uh, the theory documentation on NX NASTRAN. There is a NX NASTRAN uh, class that uh, for dynamics that you could take. Uh, there is some references. I don't have them. You know, uh, I can't cite them right now. But there is some references for random vibration analysis that I would be happy to send you. Also, in the in the class, uh, it is a three-day class, and it goes way beyond random vibration. But you can also uh, tailor the class uh, to just discuss random vibration. And I'm going to I'm going to put one more thing out there. If if you're a cu customer and you do have the the dy dynamics package. Uh, you, you get, uh, I think, up to eight hours a year in-house uh, training. So, so if you're already a customer and you got this thing and you want to know more about uh, uh, NX NASTRAN and uh, FEMAP and uh, random vibration analysis, uh, uh, give us a call and we'll, we'll work with you and, and help you out. OK. Um, how do you get stress outputs from random vibration run? OK. I, uh, I did not uh, do. Uh, in, in the option, when you select random vibration in your solutions and you start going through there, you're going to see a, t a uh, window pop up, and it's going to you have the options of uh, velocity, uh, displacement, of course, uh, forces, but there is a option for stresses, and I was about to show you the stresses there, which I had output, and so you can get stresses uh, from random vibration for for all of your elements, you know, plate elements, solid elements, whatever. So that option is there and you'll see it in the uh, random vibration solution. Okay. Can one use the random vibration solution to do an acoustic analysis? Yes, and I'm going to put a, uh, a footnote on that. Uh, the, an acoustic analysis, uh, uh, some people think of acoustic analysis as, as uh, uh, with a fluid medium around a structure and they're exciting the fluid medium uh, that, then, that then excites the structure. Uh, no, you can't do that with this, with this solution. What you can do, if you do have a pressure spectrum on a structure that's defined at the surface of the structure, you can, def you can uh, define that pressure spectrum 
as a function and apply it to the structure and then see how your structure will respond uh, to that pressure spectrum. So you can do that. Okay. And uh, I think we have time for one more question. Sure. How would you get von Mises stresses for shell and plate structures with VMAP and NX Nastran for random vibration? Okay. Uh, many people ask that question, and when you would look at the stress option, uh, it that stress option is not there. Uh, the von Mies stress option is not there in the random vibration. Uh, I need to check uh, why I have not checked why that's not there. I suspect that it's not there. Matter of fact, you're not going to see principal stresses or maximum shear stress either. Uh, you're just going to see your uh, principal stresses and shear stresses. And I think the reason why is that your your shear stress and your principal stresses that are being reported does not happen at the same time, okay? So you you know, you know could take that uh, offline into a spreadsheet or some program and compute the von Mies stress, but you, you must remember those are not happening, uh, taking place at the same time, and therefore you're gonna get a very high load, and very, it's gonna be very conservative, but it's gonna be a very high load, and it's, but it's gonna be kind of deceiving because they really do not happen at the same time. And so right now, uh, FEMAP will, will not give you the von Mies uh, stresses uh, for a random vibration. You, have, you can take it offline and compute it yourself, but I think that is the reason is because it really gives you a very high level of stress. Okay, great. And okay, that's pronounced von Mies. I'll make von a Mies. note of that. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> okay, uh, well, this concludes our meeting today. Thank you for joining and have a great day.